Welcome to I Love to Tell the Story, a podcast on the Narrative Lectionary. I'm Ralph Jacobson. I'm Christopher Van Koff. And today we're talking about Jesus and the Gerasene Demoniac, which is Mark 5, 1 through 20. And it's the reading for January 21st, 2024. And so we get in this reading, one of the things that's a distinctive feature of Mark, which is the sea crossings. We're talking about the Sea of Galilee here. And what we see is Jesus with his fishermen disciples often sails back and forth across this lake. Uh, the Bible, the New Testament calls it a sea. This is the Greek word is thalassa. But to give you a little bit of an idea, those of you who are in the upper Midwest, the Sea of Galilee is about the same size as Malax, the famous walleye fishing lake north of uh, the Twin Cities. So it's not Lake Superior size. We're not talking about a very large body of water, but you can't really see across Mille Lacs, so it's it's not small. So what does it mean that Jesus now is, for the first time in this story, traveling outside of Jewish territory? It's a very good question, and one that a lot of people have uh, asked about is, what does the geography of the Gospel of Mark mean? And what we mean is that we've talked about the Gospel of Mark as a narrative, and when we look at narratives, one of the things we want to see is not only what happens, but where do the characters go? Does it all take place in one place? Do they move? And here we see that they move. So we have been, for the most part, in Galilee, which is where Jesus is, has his home in Capernaum, which is on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. And this is a place which is historically part of the Northern Kingdom. And one of the difficulties that we have in thinking about Galilee is asking the question, and scholars have uh, fought, and I mean fought long and hard about this, is how Jewish is Galilee? And what we mean by this is that when we think about the ancient world, we have to remember that religion is very often tied to place. And when we say in the New Testament, this word that is often translated as Jews really refers properly to people from Judea, which is the historic southern kingdom. And we know in the time of the Maccabees, the, who are a, a set of Jewish kings before the time of Jesus, that people from Judea, very often people who fought in the Maccabean army, were given land and settled in Galilee. So there is a presence of Judeans there, and Jesus's family appears to be uh, connected to this. But the question is, would an ancient person have noticed that there was a big change sailing from one side of the lake to the other? I'm not convinced they would have. Others will be very uh, clear that they are. So I think that we need to be a little bit careful when we draw these stereotyped pictures of what's happening on one side of the lake versus what's happening on another. What we do know, though, is that Jesus is moving beyond the place where he's popular. Because in Galilee, like we said, people are beating his door down. Everybody is following Jesus. And despite that popularity, he leaves them behind and sails to the other side of the sea. I'm an Old Testament scholar, and so archaeologically, uh, when uh, Bibl uh, when Isra Israelite archaeologists, we don't uh, call it biblical anymore, uh, uh, uncover a village, the, the remains of a vision, a vision, a village, uh, I'm, I'm thinking too many thoughts here. One of the ways you know it's a Philistine village rather than an Israelite village, is the presence of pig bones. Uh, and so as, uh, as you'd have villages close to each other, one's Isra Israelite, and not, the next is not. We do know this, though, so that the fact that Jesus arrives here and that you've got this huge flock of pigs, that it, in some way or another, he is definitely outside of of a Jewish village uh, here. Um, now, pe people, in, w when it comes to this, uh, people get outraged. Uh, uh, people don't like the story that Jesus um, casts this legion, uh, and I've heard that a Roman legion could be uh, at full strength with 6,000. 
And of course, they never were at full strength ever. But let's just stay with the number 6,000 for fun. Uh, and some are outraged for the loss of life. The environmentalists are, are, are very upset that Jesus puts these demons into the uh, herd of swine who then throw themselves and drown. And so now you've got an ecological double disaster. But those who are more like maybe you and me, Christopher, are outraged uh, at that he's wrecked this businessman's uh, <laughs> business, that he has driven, I mean, if there's 6,000 and in current prices, uh, a pig can be worth up to $1,000. So that's a lot of money that he's cost. And, uh, and people, through it all, the one thing they don't seem to ever pay attention to is the suffering of the man. And part of the offense here is that Jesus, in order to save this man from an impossible bondage, is willing to transgress uh, all of these um, boundaries that we would set. Uh, and it's back to the Spirit of God on the loose in the neighborhood that uh, Jesus seems unconcerned by the cost, the financial cost. He seems unconcerned by the uh, environmental cost. Uh, he seems unimpressed even by the cross-cultural. He's going to cross boundaries. And he is going to save, do all of this to save just one person. And I think that in terms of the boundaries, it's important to see that, again, this might not be obvious within our modern cultural context in which we lack a lot of what we call taboos. There are these things in which, a, especially within the ancient context, where somebody would know if someone is doing X, Y, or Z, that you leave them alone. And there's a couple of very important taboos going on in this story. Number one is the man is a demoniac. He has, and as Mark points out, this word that we use is really not a demon, but an unclean spirit. It makes him somebody who is on the outside of society. Not only that, he lives among the dead. And this is a, an, important, uh, an important ritual taboo in we see this in Leviticus especially, is the ritual pollution that comes about when you encounter dead bodies, when you encounter the dead. And so we've got this combination going on here. And this goes back to what we talked about in uh, earlier in Mark in terms of Jesus and his disciples fasting. There are certain expectations that people have of Jesus as a religious leader. One of which being that he will avoid these things they know they're supposed to avoid, like demoniacs and the dead. And so again, here's a here's a way in which Jesus says, absolutely not. Because, as you pointed out, this man needs Jesus. He needs his presence. And we see that uh, the end result for the man, at least, is very good. So then you have this, um, the reaction. So, so the first part is the miracle. Mm-hmm the delivery. Uh, but then because the swine drown, the, the swine herds, right? The, the hog farmers, uh, they, uh, they go into the city and uh, tell people about it. And uh, then this, this man wants to follow Jesus. Uh, and uh, the people want Jesus to leave. You know I mean, he's caused a lot of damage to a lot of property here. Go somewhere else. And the man wants to follow him, you know, uh, and Jesus refused and said, go home to your friends and, and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and what mercy he has shown you, which is different than you see back when he's in Galilee, where he tells people, don't tell. I know, I, I know we're not going to solve this today. This is one of the big mysteries uh, and fighting points about interpreting Mark is why does Jesus, when he's here in foreign territory, Say, don't follow me, but go tell everybody what he's done for you. But back then in Jewish territory, he says, follow me, but don't tell anybody. It is a great mystery. I think one of the interesting things about this particular instance of it is that unlike, so if we go back to when Jesus forgives the sins of the man, the paralytic man, unlike in that instance, 
where the people who witness it, their reaction is to question how it happens. Here you get the funny thing where the people who's, who come to see what happens totally accept what has happened. They just don't want any part of it. <laughs> right. And so there's this difference of reaction and this difference of what he is, what he sends this man out to do in terms of uh, the reaction of the people to the miracle itself. I think that's an interesting, an interesting thing to consider as we, as you said, think about this somewhat insoluble question. So to wrap up, what do you see as good news in this passage? I think this is one of those passages where, and it, it gets, this kind of phrasing gets overburdened, but I think that this is an actual example of what we mean when we say that Jesus seeks out the people that nobody wants to be with. So often when we use that phrasing, we use it to defend groups who we are already familiar familiar or friendly to and want to shame other people for not being familiar or friendly with them. But this is an example where Jesus goes to a person who is literally out of control. There is nothing that can be done other than the arrival of Jesus to help him. And so I think that this is, when we think about that kind of phrasing, which is so popular and such a, a popular part of how we think about what Jesus means, this is the paradigmatic example of what that, who he goes to that nobody else wants to deal with.